Thanks, Rick, and uh, welcome back. Uh, they always tell me that the session immediately after lunch is the uh, most dreadful session, which is probably why it was allocated to me, because you're all full with food and ready to have that siesta that we no longer have. <laughs> so I'll try and keep you entertained. I'll, I might even switch to Vaudible for a while there if, um, uh, if we need it. But um, So thank you for uh, your attention this afternoon. And I'm going to ad be addressing uh, questions to do with um, evaluation, measuring effectiveness of crime prevention in Australia, and how do we know if it's working? Uh, we've talked about that uh, a little bit uh, already uh, today, and it's the question which seems to be on everybody's lips around the country at the moment, and um, so uh, hopefully in the next uh, half hour or so I'll be able to enlighten you or at least provoke some questions and some thoughts in your own mind about the whole question of evaluation in the crime prevention area. Now, um, when she made this observation back in the 19th century, that noted English novelist Charlotte Bronte wasn't talking about the challenges confronting those of us trying to design, implement and assess the impact of 21st century crime prevention policies and programs. She was merely commenting on uh, one of life's great truisms. We no longer have a table up here, so I'll have to... Um, this is that no matter how much effort we put into planning our great projects, so often they just don't turn out the way we expect them to. At other times, and less frequently commented upon, is when something unexpected or unanticipated occurs that causes things to turn out better than we expected. I'll let you think about your own personal example here, I'm sure you can. Either way, the thing that we always do is sit back and try to work out why what just happened happened the way it did. Within the formal knowledge economy created by our Western rational minds, we call this pro a process of evaluation. There is nothing mysterious about this. We are really just taking a few basic questions and deciding what to do next on the basis of the answers. So what we're talking about are these sorts of questions. They're pretty straightforward and um, this process includes the, uh, these sort of questions. That, you know, what just happened? Is it what I wanted to happen? Is it better or worse than what I wanted to happen? Uh, do I really know what happened or if not, why not? Do I know how to make it happen again, if indeed I want it to happen again? Could I make it happen again in a better way or produce the, a better effect next time? What have I really learned from what just happened? How can I help others learn from the experience without doing it themselves? So this is um, the way many people view the evaluation process as a nasty business. In the eye, particularly in the eyes of policy and program uh, people. For some it is uh, little more than a necessary evil carried on as a backroom task that merely adds to the already large job of delivering complex and difficult policies and programs without providing much in return. In fairness to this view, it must be acknowledged that the quality of evaluation practice in uh, crime prevention has often been of a relatively low standard. Although in recent years the bar has been reset to a higher standard and significant progress has been made, there are many uh, areas in which substantial improvements can be made in the way in which crime prevention programs and projects are evaluated. Now in Australia, because of our historic focus on uh, locally based, socially focused crime prevention initiatives, much of the uh, responsibility for evaluation has uh, happened to devolve to smaller community agencies, often local governments or not-for-profit groups uh, who are implementing uh, projects relying on short-term funding. As a result, Australia does not actually have a very strong tradition, of a uh, great tradition of generating high quality evaluations, although there are some very notable exceptions, uh, internationally famous exceptions, including uh, the Pathways to Prevention project that my brother is responsible for. In practice, um, recent work by the AIC um, suggests that imposing evaluation on local organisations as a mandatory requirement within a project funding arrangement does not guarantee the project initiative will actually be rigorously evaluated. It has also contributed to resistance to undertaking or participating in evaluation because of the perceived um, additional administrative burden. And there is evidence that sometimes it is adversely impacted on the quality of the actual service delivery. Uh, similar problems emerge when local agencies are encouraged by a central government authority to evaluate their own project activities with only minimal technical or financial support. Now, this experience is in conflict with what we all know is the true purpose and value of evaluation, or at least I hope we do. 
Put simply, evaluation is a necessary tool for improving accountability, an essential for Im informing crime prevention policy and practice, a basic tool for understanding what works best, how and why, uh, how, when and why, uh, and essential to developing a sound evidence base of what can be considered good practice in addressing crime problems. A good, a good evaluation also reflects on the design and implementation of a program to, uh, to determine whether the chosen strategy has achieved its stated objectives through a, through a dispassionate assessment of intended and unintended outcomes. Remembering that unintended outcomes can be just as important as those you're intending to uh, achieve. And knowing about them is vital. Evaluation also explores alternative explanations for these outcomes. Furthermore, evaluation will normally attempt to explain why a policy or program has or has not achieved its objectives in terms of both internal and external causes and recommend strategies to improve performance. Now, in our ex uh, experience, these factors I've, I have up here um, represent the main challenges that people experience when attempting to design and implement viable evaluations for crime prevention policy program and initiatives. A further challenge for evaluators, policy makers and practitioners is transferring the knowledge gained or lessons learned from research and evaluation into more effective crime prevention policy and practice. This is exactly the sort of stuff that Steve was talking about in his opening presentation uh, this morning. And I'm, I'm going to spend quite a lot more time talking about that uh, and, and emphasising those many of the points that he was making in his excellent presentation. So past mistakes in crime prevention, both in program de design and delivery, are often repeated because there is a dearth of available evidence demonstrating that the chosen approach is not the most effective. But they also uh, occur because decision makers have been unable or even unwilling to translate accumulated, no accumulated no knowledge into practice. Now, so how do we go about overcoming these obstacles and start developing sound and integrated evaluation strategies. Here comes the science. And this is a piece of work developed by Sandra Nutley in the UK and her colleagues focusing on our understanding of research and its process in the generation of knowledge. Now evaluation itself is a special form of research. It uses the logic of research and the tools of research. So like any sort of research, it's essential to properly understand what questions you are answering and why. So the sort of things the whale would have loved to have known the answer to and we would have liked to know what the petunias are thinking. The role of research in the policy and program development and implementation process will have different impacts depending on what it is uh, being used for. In other words, it operates like a continuum. Typically, it can act on awareness of an issue or idea generally, so something like gravity, evolution, climate change, knowledge and understanding, for example, what goes up will come down, stealing is a crime, attitudes, perceptions and ideas, for example, I really shouldn't steal, uh, policy and practice change, for example, our laws about theft, etc. Uh, and in this sense, it has a conceptual use and an instrumental use. What question we are wanting to answer or what action we are wanting to take means that we, are, we need different forms of research and evidence as it is suggested by the blue box below the arrow. Blue boxes below the arrow. Uh, I just got to double check. Fortunately, I'm using my own computer today, so the colours turn out the same way. Uh, <laughs> put it onto a PC, I never know what colour it'll come out as. Um, or if at all, in point of fact. Uh, okay, so however, one of the most important applications of research occurs when we are struggling to work out why our solutions, strategies or analyses don't seem to be right. This is, this is what's called problem reframing it involves going back to basics. Uh, this is actually a conversation in itself and it's actually one of the critical roles of evaluation. Do we actually know, have we asked the right questions? Have we actually got right, uh, uh, approached this whole problem the right way? Let's go back, let's think, let's go through it. This is a process. Now, basically the end of the continuum that we are most concerned with in crime prevention evaluation is uh, towards the right there, the instrumental use, particularly the achievement of policy and practice change. Now, let me uh, quickly go through the four main approaches to evaluation. I'm not going to dwell upon these. Um, these you can read up about anywhere. And in fact, uh, John Eck, as I've referenced at the bottom of this uh, figure, is a very good source for that. 
we have four basic uh, approaches. Uh, the gold standard, um, as used in the Campbell collaboration and as Steve was referring to this morning, um, is the randomised experiments. And these involve two or more treatments, one of which serves as a baseline or control. The purpose is to work out what will occur if no intervention is applied or if this particular intervention is present. Um, it is a very powerful. It is very powerful for measuring outcomes. However, this also has the diffi difficult uh, evaluation design to apply in practice. The next is the quasi-experiment. Um, these were developed to address the fact that randomised experiments are often unfeasible in, in uh, real-life situations. Desirable, but, un but sometimes impractical to do. The key difference is that while the intervention is uh, differentially applied to different groups, cases are not randomly assigned. And quasi-experimental designs are, not, are very common in social policy research generally and uh, also in crime prevention evaluation. Then we have natural experiments. These don't attempt to control who receives the intervention. Rather, they analyse the differences between cases who are exposed to the intervention or those who weren't. This approach has a, gen a high generalizability because of the non-intrusiveness of the method, but it also has low internal validity. It is also a very common technique as they can uh, often be applied retrospectively or after the intervention has occurred, which often is the case because very often program designers don't think that they need evaluation until they discover that they've got to explain why they, haven't, why they need money again to keep doing their program. And that's when the evaluation becomes very prominent in their minds. However, so um, this uh, often crops up as the technique applied. Um, the last one uh, is slightly different. Uh, process evaluation. It focuses on how an intervention has been applied. You can actually do process evaluation in combination with each of these and preferably you would because uh, unless you can explain the results you've found uh, then you really don't have a very powerful um, uh, result. Uh, it's um, particularly useful to, for determining if an intervention success or failure is the result of a failure of theory or a failure of practice. So was it the idea was fine, it just wasn't done well, or it actually is a bad idea and we need to throw it out and get a new one. In practice, many evaluations are actually mixtures of all four designs as access to data, etc., is often the defining design factor, not the actual science itself. So we're remembering we live in this real world. So in the best of all possible worlds, Voltaire now, um, this is how the link between an evaluation and the program policy process would uh, look. Evac evaluation acts as a key component in a systematic process for the refinement and accumulation of evidence about what works and why. And this is what we try to do. We, we actually try to um, undertake evaluation, which is looking at the interventions, looking at the objectives, options, appraisal, consultation, cyclical process, which is really designed to try and push us all towards growing our evidence base and learning what to do better in the future. It's an ideal type model. In practice, uh, such a process is actually consistent with our traditional model of what's been come to be known as from science to service. Such a process actually sees us doing a research study, me standing up here telling you all about it, and then you going away and doing it. And that's how you're supposed to be tr have this transferred into good practice. We know the world's not like that. And this is because of the inconclusive nature of much evaluation research. The evaluation results are often uh, not timely or relevant to practice concerns. People who run programs and design uh, and develop policies live in a, in, in a real world time frame and actually will quickly change as they react to its circumstances and context, particularly in the policy context where, where politicians react to um, external stimuli, as Steve was talking about uh, today as well. We also find that there's a poor communication of findings. We, as evaluators, researchers, don't do a very good job of explaining it very well. Uh, we think, well, well, here it is. You have a look at it. It's pretty straightforward. You can work it out. I worked it out. Why can't you work it out? We don't put a lot of effort into or, or even understand, uh, another point Steve was making, the implications of practice. Um, we're not in that world, or a lot of us aren't. 
um, there's often a lack of time for practitioners to engage uh, with the evaluation findings. You get presented to them, then you're supposed to go away and do something with it immediately, and then I've gone, or, or whoever else is presenting the uh, findings is gone. You have questions which emerge afterwards, and you find it difficult sometimes to come back to those people who did that research and evaluation for you. There are competing priorities and low priority attached to awareness and use of evaluation findings very often. There's also a competing knowledge about best practice. There's, you know, there's, there's no one real truth. Um, I just asked the whale. Um, and uh, we actually have to accept that and live with that and work with that. Furthermore, individuals can be resistant to using findings, particularly when they seem to be counterintuitive to established practice. I mean, I used to do it that way. It's always worked that way. Why do I have to change now? I mean, it seems to be working fine. I, I mean, I've got to put all this effort into changing uh, how I go about my practice, my work. And that then grows into another level, which is uh, there can be, uh, or maybe, hostile organisation or sector culture reluctant to embrace the change process as indicated by the evaluation findings. It's a bit like Steve saying, you know, I should be seeing whether or not people are getting fired if they don't do their job the way it should be as, as effectively as possible. That carries personal implications and risks and therefore will generate a view and attitude about how I handle the, the findings of research if that is part of the, uh, 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 the process. Not saying it shouldn't happen, I'm just saying it's part of the uh, understanding of research and evaluation impl uh, impl implementation. So what we do, how do we go forward? The modern understanding of how the evaluation process can best uh, assist and guide optimum policy and program development processes is focused on moving away from the didactic packaging of knowledge and static knowledge transfer processes, such as me standing here and talking to you today, towards more interactive and interpretive models which recognise the importance of context, the value of tacit and experiential knowledge. You know, people learn a lot in their professions and they know a lot about what the problems are and you really need to actually be part of that process to understand how they're, why they're doing things the way they're doing. Uh, the use of collaborations and engaged processes and the viewing of research use as an ongoing process, not as a single event. Now, this means changing how we think about measuring policy and program impact. Basically, there are two closely related but different tools that are critical for measuring the effectiveness of any policy or program. Performance measurement and formal evaluation. Each is a, is a distinct but related technique. Both work from some common data sources and build from the program logic model that underlies any program or program. Yes, believe it or not, every program has some program logic underneath it. You've designed it, you've thought, I'm doing this with these resources to produce this effect. This is my program logic. Uh, however, they differ in their time horizons, their assumptions, and particular uses. Performance measurement can provide insight into whether a policy or program is likely to achieve its objectives by enabling ongoing monitoring of key performance information. Evaluation feeds into higher level decisions about the choice and design of policies and programs, uh, while performance measurement is used mainly for day-to-day -day management and accountability. The performance measurement system represents an ongoing learning tool to identify what practices are going well and what needs to be fixed changed or even abandoned in the light of changing circumstances, new problems and improved practice. Performance measurement is an integral component of a performance management system. Performance management is the practice of reviewing program performance, identifying factors which may be impacting upon current and future performance and making informed decisions regarding appropriate action to improve the performance of a program. The presence of a good performance measurement system significantly assists in the implementation of an effective evaluation strategy. So why think about performance measurement? Let's think about crime prevention itself. Crime prevention is a future focused and intended to is future focused and intended to cause change in our community, mostly in terms of reducing and preventing crime. However, because crime prevention practice often involves complex partnerships and multi-agency activity across various sectors and at different levels of society, not all factors are going to be able to be directly impacted on by our efforts. Performance measurement can uh, help us to assess how well we are doing ourselves and determine if it is having the sorts of effects we believe through our theories that we need to have to, um, to, to, have, to have longer preventative effects. Now, measuring performance is like telling a story. 
The foundation of a good performance story is a detailed understanding of the program whose performance is to be measured, and the first step is to take the program apart, analyse it to understand it. And these are the basic steps for being able to tell that story. I'll tell a story. Rick uh, and I first met when I was asked to come to uh, evaluate or look at the performance of the crime reduction program in the UK. That ha I won't go into details about that program because I've talked about it too many times to stop myself getting bored by hearing about it. Uh, but um, that was a program which had um, three basic goals, five streams of uh, uh, program activity which then transferred into 1,500-odd individual projects. Part of the process of the work I did was to actually talk with people about what they knew about this thing called the Crime Reduction Program. What, did they know what the goals were? What part of the, uh, of, of the um, uh, objectives were they, was their work addressing? And I don't mean, I'm not trying to be disparaging in this next remark, but I found it almost impossible to find anybody, including at the very highest level of the Home Office, who actually knew that the program had three goals, that it had five objectives, that it had all these component parts, they all focused on what they were doing. Now that is perfectly understandable. Uh, so they actually couldn't agree on what the goals were. So I found it impossible, in fact, to actually say that this was a program. Uh, well, I probably should have been more forthright in saying that, but um, uh, I can say that with 10 years reflection now. But um, uh, that's the sort of problem we're talking about. They didn't understand the program logic, the underlying logic of uh, what was going, how the link inputs link to activities and outputs to ultimate objectives and outcomes. Uh, part of the explanation for that was because it was too big. It was being managed as a very complex program, rushed out, I think, in my opinion, rushed out. Sorry, I'm looking at Rick because he was part of the, 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 the thing. And... Um, uh, uh, and um, uh, it, it really didn't have time to mature and come together in people's minds about, um, uh, about what they were trying to do and so they couldn't really understand it. So it actually ultimately became an um, unfortunate example of how not to do work, um, even though they invested so much money in it. However, there are a few things to consider in the real challenge for measuring the effects of prevention efforts, usually actually measuring or something that we're trying to prevent happening. In other words, measuring the unmeasurable. Here are a few tips for helping you to do so. We suggest using mixed methods uh, as defined by the circumstance. Now, mixed methods means you don't slavishly pursue a quantitative or slavishly pursue a qualitative method. Uh, you actually work out what you need, what method you need to use in particular circumstances to answer particular questions. And that means you have to have a good understanding of the questions you're actually trying to address and a good understanding of the way people are doing their work. Recognise there is much to be gained from using these qualitative measures such as opinion and perceptions of change as well as the more traditional quantitative measures. After all, one helps to explain the other. Remember the limits of your interventions reach and measure appropriately. For example, good violence prevention strategies often begin by trying to improve the reporting rates of violence as a prelude to further interventions. So increasing reported rates of uh, violence can be a measure of success, not failure, when viewed as part of a longer term strategy. So set the targets, set the intermediates, understand where the, where the, um, the steps are in this project. Understand it as a long-term strategy, assuming it is. Um, and sometimes you can't actually directly measure uh, outcomes, but you can measure, improve, uh, you can measure what we call proxies. Um, so you can measure, for example, improved school retention as a proxy to reduce street violence as long as it makes sense to do so and you have some evidence that this relationship exists. So you just can't pick anything because you can measure it, you actually have to have evidence that it has some relationship to long-term outcomes. So, can it be done? Well, Canada has developed a mixed methods model for its national strategy. I'm not sure how healthy the implementation of that natural, national strategy is at the moment. Um, where are you? Uh, Pat may be able to tell us something about that later, I don't know. Um, the UK has experimented with various systems for use with a number of its crime reduction programs in recent years. They have learned the lessons from the, uh, from the crime reduction program uh, in the late last uh, century. Not nice saying that. Um, but here in, the, uh, in Australia, the AIC has put a quite a bit of effort into um, developing uh, underlying performance measurement 
frameworks for underpinning long-term evaluations and measure, measurements of effectiveness of programs. For example, we've done it with uh, measuring the impact of drug law enforcement in Australia. Um, it took us five years. Uh, Katie Willis, who's here in the room, uh, is largely responsible for the success of that. And we actually not only developed it, we got a consensus agreement that it was a good way to proceed. We then allowed to actually go in and trial, test, run it, uh, have them discover that in point of fact that wasn't going to cause the end of the universe and the end of the world uh, by uh, introducing some of these things and we've now seen at least some slow uh, uh, adoption uh, of it in certain uh, uh, certain sectors and I'm not surprised that it has it is only slow adoption because we are talking about a process of change we've also um, had the opportunity with the West Australian Government of developing a model framework for measuring performance of community crime prevention activity in Western Australia. Um, unfortunately, we haven't had the opportunity to uh, implement it, but this is what it looked like. I can't read it. I know you can't read it. Uh, but um, it's the this is the basic logic of the performance measurement framework for that program. It, is, uh, it was developed by Anthony Morgan, who's also in the room here, in collaboration with the WI Office of uh, uh, Crime Prevention, David Ray here representing them, and local authorities in, in the West. Uh, what is most instructive about this illegible slide that I've put up here um, is that Ant the way Anthony has constructed the logic of this framework so as to allow for different for the use of different data collection methods at different points in the um, uh, in the system. So what he did is he actually saw that this was a dynamic system, and so proceeded to identify and implement, or, or at least identify the need for the use of different forms of data collection, different data sources at different points as we're working through the system. Essentially, what he's done is to lay out a storyboard that allows a policy or a program manager to ask different but pertinent questions at different points in the process of implementing this program as well. Because in the real world, um, when we're talking about local community crime prevention, th different communities are at different points in their implementation process. Some are starting up thinking about it. Some are actually doing some of their first strategi strategizing and putting their plans together. Some are actually in the implementation phase. So you need to have different information sources at different points. Um, and this sort of framework also allows both central managers and local program managers to assess their performance and effectiveness at these different points and against these different priorities from within a shared framework that ultimately makes sense when looked at as a whole, or at least that's the plan since we haven't actually got the ch uh, chance to do this yet. Um, this framework might make, uh, makes you might make you think that the task is terribly complex and hard and so it would, uh, I'd like to finish with a short story uh, of just how straightforward it would be in practice. To do this, I want to go back in time, around about 15 years, to a place not so far from here. The story of an unusual and at the time quite novel response to what is unfortunately a not so unusual Australian problem. Alcohol fuel, fueled violence and racially, racially motivated public violence that escalated into a riot. However, as I, said in the uh, as I said, the response was unusual. Not just because the community, government and businesses got together to cooperate in solving the problem quite comprehensively, but because it was a well-studied and documented intervention that was, uh, was uh, effectively measured for effectiveness and efficiency. In effect, geez, I was full of effects at this point when I was thinking about this. In effect, an outcome evaluation and performance measurement exercise taken in precisely the way, undertaken in precisely the way I'm suggesting programs should be assessed. But the most curious thing uh, was that we did this with only the most rudimentary understanding of the thinking behind the sort of processes I've just been describing. And so the point I'm trying to say about this, and I want you to think about as we do, go, I go through the description of what happened, is that it isn't actually that hard to do this. We can actually do it with um, some basic understanding of, of steps and principles. We don't get, need to get hung up in the science. We need to understand the science. We need to respect the science. But we actually have to be practical about the way we do these things. So let's begin. Let me talk to you about it. Bondi Beach, most, many here will know it. It's an iconic tourist destination. Over the years, it had become one of the most popular destinations for so-called orphan backpackers to get uh, to, to, to gather um, 
uh, for um, uh, Christmas and New Year's Eve. By Christmas New Year 95, 1995, it had become so popular that around 20,000 young people gathered in the sun beneath, between the beach and the road, and alcohol to some extent and other drugs were a significant feature of the celebration. Bondi itself actually is also a it was also popular with uh, young male car enthusiasts from Western Sydney who used the promenade between the beach and the shop fronts to meet and show off their car. As it happens, these blokes are mostly second generation migrants of Middle Eastern background. So we have a situation where there's a certain amount of um, conflict. Basically what happened in 1994 was that uh, riots began in the evening of uh, Christmas Day. The, we had conflict between the beach partiers who were actually, I'll, I'll move on to the next slide because it tells you um, some of what happened. Uh, we had riot, uh, it boiled down into riot between the, um, uh, the beach partiers who were actually exiting the beach and the guys on their cars cruising up and down. It's, um, it was ugly, uh, uh, but by about 11.30pm the crowd was estimated at about 15,000 and growing and at 2am there was about 20,000 people there. There were bashings, uh, groups provoking and attacking single males and stabbings in the park. Again, the crowd turned on the police, and Bondi Park became a no-go area for police for about five areas, five hours. Now, in '95, uh, I was the director of the Crime Prevention Division of the New South Wales uh, Attorney General's Department, and as such, following a post-mortem and audit of the cost of the riot, it felt to me to coordinate the response to the prim uh, at the premier's insistence that the riots not recur next year. These are the joys that uh, Brendan, my colleague here, is very familiar with. Uh, we have a problem, it's your job, fix it. Get on with it. We quickly discovered that the estimated direct financial cost from the riots was around about $369,000 as detailed here. Uh, there were intangible costs which included increased fear and lack of confidence in the safety of the uh, area. Negative images transmitted around the world affecting tourism and a loss of trade for local business. Now, the plan that was developed was the result of a problem-solving partnership between local residents, businesses, local government and state government agencies. Rather than relying upon a standard law and order response, for example, just policing and control alone, they adopted, and this was the choice of the community through their local government authority and their commi local committee, they adopted an innovative risk management approach built on a number of strong evidence-informed strategies about how to manage community celebrations and public events. So they decided not to shut it down. We will try this with a, some structure and some order in place. Ah, it's going to work now. So the party became an organised community festival. Entertainment featured strongly. Security was comprehensive but discreet. Rules for participation were clear. Some events were uh, ticketed, others were free. Access to alcohol was controlled. Residents worked as volunteers, so they just weren't spectators or standing aside from the event. They actually were part of the organisation of the event. Cleaning was constant. So there wasn't allowed to be any opportunity for accumulation of rubbish. So that's a situational crime prevention measure mixed in with a community-based social crime prevention approach. Transport, traffic access and exits were all managed. Health and safety uh, services were obvious. Uh, and fringe events uh, were used to break up crowd concentration during the course of the um, day as it went into the evening. Now the result was that in 96 the events were effectively crime free. Um, the investment of $150,000 by the New South Wales government produced a $220,000 direct saving to the uh, community, a net 150% return on the investment, and other substantial less tangible benefits in terms of business and community confidence. There were also unquestionable political benefits as the Premier was able to take credit for solving a very high profile public disorder event. These are the sort of things that actually help crime prevention's reputation enormously. And that's actually part of what made the Bondi Beach project so successful. 
It's reasonable to argue that the uh, Bondi project was actually unusual because it had a high profile and strong political will behind it about getting it right. But there was also a high level of pragmatism behind it as well as the determination to prevent the recurrence of the rioting. The real, po real point is that uh, it demonstrates that, what, that it actually isn't that hard to design performance measurement and evaluation processes into crime prevention and issues right at the start of the design process. We knew how much it had cost. We knew the damage which had occurred. We actually pulled all that together uh, so that we actually had something to measure against when we came back afterwards. As one of the Premier's advisors said to me, well, OK, come on, Peter, have a go. It could hardly be worse. Well, it could have been, but um, um, I didn't want to disabuse him of that view. Uh, furthermore, these measures don't always have to be of the highest form of science to be useful and influential. However, they need to be robust, um, reliable and meaningful to all those who are going to make, them, uh, make use of them to assess whether an initiative, program or policy has been worth uh, doing. They also need to be able to, able to explain why and what happened what happened the way it did, and uh, how it could be done effectively again. Now, not every project, part of the project, Bondo project worked perfectly. For example, I understand that the promoter of the main beach event somehow or other lost $60,000 in ticket receipts, as well as eventually losing himself. Um, uh, I don't know if the authorities ever caught up with him, but um, these, these things occur in uh, real events. And that's an important thing to know about, because when you're designing these sorts of things, you have to, to approach it from a risk point of view, uh, and you need to be um, able to contain those risks or minimise them as much as possible. But the real message was that, uh, that the, in fact, the Bondo riots have been largely forgotten as they haven't recurred. Um, unfortunately, as we discovered 10 years later at Cronulla Beach, many of the key lessons from Bondo actually had been forgotten. Um, and this is the continuing gap in the evaluation and practice relationship, the consolidation application of learning over time. Rick will be pleased to know I'm about to conclude. Um, probably you as well. So in conclusion, what does all this mean? Well, most of the points here are self-evident. Well, I think they are. Allow me to highlight a few. Selecting an appropriate evaluation model requires consideration of the characteristics of the program, of, of the purpose of the evaluation study, of the available options, and of the views of key stakeholders. There is a need to find an appropriate balance between evaluations that seek to identify what works in crime prevention through rigorous scientific methods and those that place greater emphasis on developing a more detailed understanding of good practice and what can be done and in what circumstances to prevent crime. There is a growing recognition of the importance of theory. Programs are theories based on an understanding of why a, pro a problem has emerged and what can be done for whom in what circumstances. Evaluation should be geared towards generating general lessons that can guide crime prevention practice, and generalisation is permitted through the application and testing of that theory. The long-term nature of many crime prevention programs, particularly those that attempt to address the underlying social determinants uh, um, of crime, requires innovative approaches to evaluation, including the application of appropriate modelling and forecasting methodologies. Finally, we need to ensure that both performance measurement and evaluation measures have effective feedback mechanisms so that the lessons learned are shared and the findings can be properly interpreted and applied in practice. Thank you.